Picture this, you're running an airline and suddenly you're forced to buy three of the world's largest, most expensive passenger jets that you never wanted in the first place. Sounds crazy, right? Well, that's exactly what happened to All Nippon Airways, or ANA, Japan's largest airline. This is the story of how corporate bankruptcy, airport politics and high-stakes negotiations led to ANA becoming one of the most unusual operators of the Airbus A380. Stick around because this tale has more twists than a roller coaster. Before we get into ANA's predicament, let's talk about the Airbus A380 itself. This beast of an aircraft is absolutely massive. We're talking about the world's largest passenger airliner and the only full-length double-decker aircraft to ever enter commercial service. The A380 story begins way back in 1988 when Airbus, the European aircraft manufacturer, started dreaming big. They wanted to challenge Boeing's dominance in the large aircraft market, particularly the iconic Boeing 747, which had ruled the skies since the 1970s. After years of development, Airbus officially launched the A380 program in December 2000, investing over $10 billion into making this giant of the skies a reality. Oh, the result? An engineering marvel that can carry over 500 passengers in a typical configuration, though some airlines have configured them to carry even more. It has two full passenger decks running the entire length of the aircraft. When you see one of these things at an airport gate, it's absolutely mind-blowing how enormous it is. Now here's the thing about the A380. It's incredibly expensive to operate. Think of it this way. You've got two entire decks to fill with passengers, which means you need routes with massive demand. You need expensive maintenance, specially trained crews, and airports with infrastructure that can handle such a large aircraft. Not every airport can even accommodate the A380 because it requires reinforced gates, wider taxiways, and special ground equipment. This is why most successful A380 operators like Emirates buy them in bulk. Emirates, for example, operates over a hundred A380s. When you operate that many, you can streamline maintenance, training and operations. It's all about economies of scale. But operating just two or three A380s? That's a financial nightmare because you don't get those benefits. As of now, Airbus has completely stopped producing the A380. They built a total of 251 aircrafts before shutting down the production line. Several airlines have already retired their entire A380 fleets, including Air France, Malaysia Airlines, Etai Airways. The remaining operators are mostly large carriers like Emirates, Singapore Airlines, British Airways and Qantas. And then there's ANA, with just three aircraft crafts, making them one of the smallest A380 operators in the world. So how did ANA end up with these jets? To understand that, we need to rewind to 2015 and talk about Skymark Airlines. Skymark was a Japanese low-cost carrier like Spirit Airlines or Ryanair. They were smaller, focused on budget-conscious travelers, and generally flew domestic routes within Japan. But in 2011, Skymark's management had ambitious plans. They wanted to break into the international market in a big way, and they made a shocking announcement. They were ordering not one, not two, but initially six Airbus A380s. Let me repeat that, a small, low-cost carrier was ordering the world's most expensive passenger aircraft. Industry experts immediately raised their eyebrows. This made absolutely no sense from a business perspective. Skymark was a budget airline with a business model built around keeping costs low and operations simple. The A380 is the complete opposite of that philosophy. It's a high-cost, complex aircraft designed for high-volume premium routes. It would be like a food truck deciding to open a five-star restaurant before they've even mastered making burgers. The concerns turned out to be completely justified. By early 2015, the inevitable happened. On January 28, 2015, Skymark Airlines declared bankruptcy. They couldn't keep up with their financial obligations and their grand A380 plans crumbled. Two of the A380s they had ordered were already built and sitting in Toulouse, France, where Airbus manufactures these aircrafts Airbus was stuck with these massive jets and a bankrupt customer who couldn't pay for them. But here's where it gets really interesting. Skymark might have failed as a business, but they owned something incredibly valuable. 36 daily takeoff and landing slot pairs at Tokyo Haneda Airport. Now, if you're not familiar with airport slots, let me explain why these were such a big deal. An airport slot is basically permission to take off or land at a specific time. 
At busy airports, these slots are like gold bars. Tokyo Haneda Airport is one of the most congested, slot-restricted airports in the world. It's located much closer to downtown Tokyo than Narita Airport, making it far more convenient for business and leisure travelers. Getting new slots at Haneda is incredibly difficult. Airlines will pay millions for them, fight legal battles over them, and make major business decisions based on them. So when Skymark went bankrupt with 36 daily slot pairs up for grabs, it set off a feeding frenzy. Several major players immediately showed interest. All Nippon Airways wanted those slots to expand their domestic network. Delta Airlines, the major American carrier, saw an opportunity to gain a stronger foothold in the Japanese market. There was also interest from Hainan Airlines and Jetstar. Whoever won the bid to restructure Skymark would likely gain control of those precious Haneda slots. But there was a massive complication. Airbus was Skymark's second largest creditor. They were owed a huge amount of money for those A380s and Airbus made it crystal clear that they would not support any restructuring plan that didn't involve someone taking at least some of those A380 aircrafts. ANA was in a tough position. They desperately wanted those Haneda slots for strategic reasons. Having more slots would allow them to increase frequencies on profitable domestic routes and better compete against their rival Japan Airlines. But they had absolutely zero interest in operating the A380. It didn't fit their fleet strategy at all. ANA's business model for international routes was built around using smaller, efficient twin-engine jets like the Boeing 777 or the Dreamliner. These aircraft allowed them to operate higher frequencies on busy routes and open up thinner routes that couldn't support larger aircraft. The A380 was the complete opposite of everything they believed in operationally. Meanwhile, Delta saw an opportunity to establish a major presence in Japan, which would have been a nightmare scenario for ANA. The Japanese government also preferred a domestic solution to keep Skymark's assets in Japanese hands and maintain stability in the local aviation market. Airbus played hardball. They essentially told everyone involved that if ANA's restructuring plan for Skymark didn't include taking the A380s, Airbus wouldn't support it and without Airbus's support as a major creditor, ANA's bid would likely fail. Airbus even made a public statement saying there was a significant and realistic risk that any plan without their support wouldn't gain approval. Think about the position ANA was in. It was like someone offering you your dream house, but telling you that you also had to adopt three elephants that came with the property. You don't want the elephants, you don't know what to do with the elephants. And the elephants are incredibly expensive to maintain. But the house is so valuable that you're willing to deal with the elephant problem. In August 2015, during the creditor's vote on Skymark's future, Airbus switched their support to ANA's bid instead of Delta's proposal. This was the turning point. A few months later, in December 2015, ANA officially announced they would purchase three Airbus A380s, all originally destined for Skymark. Let me be clear about what happened here. ANA didn't want these planes. They were forced into this purchase because it was the only way to secure those valuable Haneda slots and prevent a major foreign competitor from gaining a foothold in their home market. It was the corporate equivalent of taking one for the team. The silver lining was that since these aircraft were already in production for Skymark, ANA could get them relatively quickly without waiting years for new production slots. They inherited delivery positions that were already in the pipeline, but that also meant they had to quickly figure out what on earth they were going to do with three of the world's largest passenger jets. So ANA had three A380s coming their way whether they liked it or not. The question became, where do you deploy aircraft this large when they don't fit your business model? The airline's management team had to get creative. They needed a route with extremely high passenger demand that could justify the A380's and massive capacity. After careful analysis, they identified one perfect candidate, Tokyo to Honolulu, Hawaii. The Japan-Hawaii route is absolutely massive. It's one of the largest international leisure markets in the world. Japanese tourists love Hawaii. We're talking hundreds of thousands of passengers annually. Honolulu's pristine beaches, perfect weather and welcoming atmosphere make it one of the top vacation destinations for Japanese travelers. In fact, between October 2021 and September 2022, over 270,000 passengers traveled between Tokyo's airports and Honolulu. 
this route made strategic sense for several reasons. First, the sheer volume of passengers meant ANA could realistically fill the A380's seats. Second, it's a leisure-heavy route where passengers value the experience. ANA could market the A380 as something special, a unique way to fly to Hawaii. Third, and this is crucial, ANA was facing increased competition on this route. Their main rival, Japan Airlines, was operating the route aggressively. Plus, in 2018, Japan Airlines had founded Zipair Tokyo, a low-cost subsidiary specifically targeting long-haul leisure routes like Tokyo to Honolulu. ANA needed to respond with both capacity and product quality. The A380 allowed ANA to do both. They configured their A380s with 520 seats across four classes, eight first-class suites, 56 business-class seats, 73 premium economy seats, and 383 economy seats. This gave them significantly more capacity than their competitors' Boeing 777s and Boeing Dreamliners, allowing them to offer more competitive fares while also providing an incredible premium cabin experience. ANA also made a brilliant marketing decision. They gave each of their three A380s special liveries featuring Hawaiian sea turtles, which are called Honu in Hawaiian. The three aircraft were painted in blue, green and orange turtle designs, making them instantly recognizable and highly Instagrammable. They branded the service as Flying Honu, creating a unique identity that resonated with travelers. The first A380 was delivered to ANA in March 2019, with the other two following shortly after. The aircraft entered service in May 2019, and initially things seemed promising. The unique liveries generated massive buzz on social media. Aviation enthusiasts made special trips just to fly on these aircraft. ANA had successfully turned a forced purchase into a marketing opportunity, but then COVID-19 hit in early 2020 and the aviation industry collapsed, international travel ground to a virtual halt. Japan imposed some of the strictest travel restrictions in the world. The Hawaii route, which depends entirely on leisure travel, was devastated. Even after travel restrictions eased and the industry began recovering, ANA's A380s face challenges. Recent data from 2024 shows that these flights are often flying half empty or worse. Load factors, the percentage of seats filled, sometimes dipped as low as 43% on certain flights. Think about that. An aircraft with 520 seats flying with only about 224 passengers. That's a financial disaster. In 2023, the A380s achieved an average load factor of 69%, which was better but still not great for such an expensive aircraft to operate. The situation got worse in 2024 despite the route's popularity and high ticket prices. There are several reasons for these low load factors. The weak Japanese yen has made international travel more expensive for Japanese tourists. Economic uncertainty has reduced discretionary travel spending. And the point-to-point -point nature of the route means ANA can't fill the aircraft with connecting passengers from other cities. So here's the million dollar question. Looking back, was this whole deal worth it for ANA? On the negative side, ANA is stuck operating three aircraft they never wanted, on routes where they struggle to achieve profitable load factors. The A380s require specialized maintenance, specially trained crews, and can only operate from airports with appropriate infrastructure. With just three aircraft, ANA doesn't benefit from the economies of scale that make the A380 viable for larger operators like Emirates. The aircrafts are also extremely limiting. ANA's A380s can only operate from Narita Airport, not the more convenient Haneda, because Haneda doesn't have the infrastructure for A380 operations. This limits their flexibility and makes it harder to feed passengers from domestic connections. During the COVID pandemic, when these aircraft sat idle, they were burning money while generating zero revenue. Even in recovery, they're flying significantly under capacity, which means ANA is operating flights at a loss or minimal profit. However, on the positive side, ANA did achieve their primary objective. They got those incredibly valuable Haneda slots. These slots have allowed them to expand their domestic network and maintain their competitive position against Japan Airlines. The value of these slots over the long term likely justifies the short-term pain of operating the A380s. The A380s also gave ANA a significant capacity advantage on the Tokyo-Honolulu route. 
they can offer twice daily service with premium products that exceed what Japan Airlines offers in first and business class. This helps them compete against both full service and low cost competitors. From a brand perspective, the flying Honu aircraft have been a massive success. They've generated enormous positive publicity, strengthened ANA's association with Hawaiian travel, and created a unique, memorable product that stands out in the market. You can't buy that kind of brand recognition easily. The story of ANA and the Airbus A380 is ultimately a tale of unintended consequences and making the best of a difficult situation. Anna never set out to become an A380 operator. They were backed into a corner by circumstances beyond their control and had to choose between accepting aircraft they didn't want or losing out on valuable airport slots to a competitor. They chose to take the aircraft and have spent the years since trying to make the economics work. It's been a struggle, especially with recent low load factors, but ANA's CEO has stated they plan to continue operating these aircrafts as long as possible. They've made significant investments in configuring and marketing these planes, and backing out now would mean acknowledging total defeat. The broader lesson here is that airline fleet planning isn't always about what makes the most sense operationally. Sometimes it's about corporate politics, airport access, and competitive positioning. ANA's A380 operation will likely never be as efficient as their Dreamliners and 777s, but the strategic value of those Haneda slots and the competitive advantage on the Hawaii route might just make it worth the hassle. What do you think? Did ANA make the right call or should they have walked away from the Haneda slots? Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this deep dive into aviation business strategy, make sure to like this video and subscribe for more content. Until next time, keep your eyes on the skies.